economics is a social science built around solving one simple problem. We as humans have unlimited desires, but limited means in which to fulfil those desires, which inevitably means that we will go without some of the things that we really want. This problem is, for the most part, unsolvable, but we can try and get the best possible results by answering four questions. What should be produced? How much should be produced? How should it be produced? And for whom should it be produced? All economic theories and schools of thought are built around answering these questions in slightly different ways to deliver what we think is the optimal outcome. Capitalism will produce what is demanded by the market in a way that investors and managers deem optimal and produce it for people with the means to buy those goods or services. Socialism will produce what is demanded by the people in a way that the government deems optimal and it will produce it for those with a need for those goods or services. And yes, this is a very rough example that I'm sure some political compass purists will call me out on, but you get the idea. All of economics is dedicated to answering these questions in slightly more optimal ways. Of course, the very best way to answer them is to make a surplus of everything in the easiest way possible for anybody who wants it. But that isn't possible unless we lived in a totally post-scarcity universe, which we don't. We live in the real world with real limitations on resources. However, the next best thing we can do is grow. If we are able to make more goods and services every year, then we are able to improve living standards for more people, which makes all of these questions easier to answer. Economics is a really tough field if you are deciding between who gets food and housing. It's a lot easier if you're deciding if people should get free college or a bigger tax break. The former are decisions that economists will need to make if they don't grow their output, and the latter are decisions made by economies that have achieved sustained growth. But is endless growth even possible in a finite world? If it is possible, how? And if it isn't possible, what does that mean for the future of humanity? This episode of Economics Explained was brought to you by Brilliant. I love teaching and that is why I know that the best way to properly learn something is by doing. And that's what Brilliant is all about. I recently wanted to brush up on my statistics and probability skills, so it was a choice between reading through my old university textbooks or taking Brilliant's hands-on course. Even as someone who had previously used probability models on a professional level, I never felt as if the lessons were moving at too slow a pace and the interactive experiments gave me new insights into how I could use what I thought was otherwise purely academic knowledge. If you want to learn and understand, and I mean really understand STEM subjects, there really isn't a better tool on the internet than Brilliant. To get started for free, go to brilliant.org slash economics explained or click the link in the description below. And the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Economic growth is measured as the change in an economy's output, typically measured in GDP, over time. I made an entire video recently on my second channel explaining everything you need to know about GDP. So if you're unsure about anything at any point in this video, feel free to pause it and go check out that quick explanation before you come back here. Now, most developed economies target a long-term growth rate of around 2-3%. to the world as a whole has had a GDP growth rate of a little over 3% over the past five decades and developing economies like China target an even higher rate because they want to catch up with the general quality of life of advanced economies. China in particular has been responsible for lifting more than a billion people out of poverty thanks to their intense economic growth over the past three decades. So pursuing economic growth really does do a lot of good. But it can also do a lot of harm. Taken to the extreme, there are only so many resources on Earth. There is only so much farmland, iron ore, fossil fuels and fresh water. We can improve how much we get out of all of these resources by using more efficient farming techniques, recycling, exploring renewables and building out infrastructure, but there is still ultimately a limit. A limit that we are likely to hit first with the damage that the exploitation of all of these resources is doing to our environment. To combat this, a lot of powerful people have started to champion the idea of a zero growth world. If we don't increase our usage of resources, then things like pollution and greenhouse gas emissions will also stagnate. This is not necessarily incorrect, but the people making these arguments are not the ones that are going to benefit most from economic growth in the coming decades. 
If an Australian has to do away with a fifth bedroom on their house, or an American has to make do with a car that isn't the size of a one bedroom apartment, then that's probably a worthy sacrifice to make sure that we don't destroy our planet. But asking a developing nation, which remember are the ones that often grow at the fastest rate, to not improve the lives of their citizens because all of the advanced economies have screwed up the planet to enrich themselves is kind of unfair. It's also an unfair thing to ask of even the wealthiest nations in the world. As the world has grown, it has grown more unequal. Modern billionaires are the wealthiest people that the world has ever known, with living standards that easily put kings and emperors of previous centuries to shame. They are enjoying this wealth, all while people that live in the same countries as them subsist meal to meal. Now, while their lives are undoubtedly better and more comfortable than most other humans throughout the ages, they are also much more aware of the vast wealth gap because it is constantly shown to them. In an economy where every year we are all getting slightly richer on average, this gap is easier to ignore because, on average, everybody's living standards will be increasing. It's Piketty's rising tide that lifts all boats. But if nations around the world enact a policy of zero growth, the world becomes a zero-sum game, where if someone else has too much, it's because someone somewhere else has too little. I'm not a political scientist, but it is very easy to predict that this would have some negative impacts on social stability. Even if it doesn't come to riots and guillotines, it's inherently human nature to want more, to strive for better things, to improve the lives of ourselves and the people around us. So, saying that we have hit a wall and we need to be happy with the status quo indefinitely is just not a sound plan, no matter how high the stakes are. It's also not good economics. The entire reason that economics exists is to solve this problem. And just because we run into some limits on the means by which we fulfil insatiable human desires does not mean that we should give up. That would be like a physicist giving up on explaining the workings of the universe because string theory got a little bit too difficult for them. And the reality is that we can grow endlessly. And I don't mean in the sense that Elon Musk is going to save us all by turning us into an interstellar empire that can harvest the resources of entire planets. Hopefully that will happen one day, but for now, good economists need to prepare some more mundane solutions to the central economic problem. So for this next part, I want to reduce the scope of that problem a little bit. I want to change humans have unlimited desires but limited means in which to fulfil those desires into our global economy should continue to grow, but it needs to do it in such a way as to stop damaging the planet as severely as it has been. Whether you believe in global warming or not, it really doesn't matter, because most of the world's largest economies are going to be enacting policies designed to reduce emissions and pollution anyway, and that has the potential to come at the expense of absolute output. Reducing global temperature increases is not the only limitation that our global economy will have to deal with, but it is the most pressing. Other things to consider is that on our path to endless growth, we are also going to eventually run out of fossil fuels, rare earth metals, fresh water supplies, and productive farmland. But for now, let's focus on the first hurdle, which is simply not burning down our basket of resources. If global economic growth was to continue at its current rate until the year 2050, we would have a global GDP two to three times larger than we do today. All other things been equal, this means that our emissions would also be two to three times higher, which is obviously not optimal. The simple solution is invest into renewables, which would certainly help, but it still doesn't solve the issue of us using three times as much of everything else, including making three times as much trash. This is not to mention the fact that developing nations tend to opt for easier to implement industrial practices which are more damaging to the environment and emissions goals. So that means that we are back at square one. Unless we break the golden rule of economics and assume that maybe all other things are not equal. There are two broad ways that economies can achieve growth. They can do it by simply making more stuff, or by making better stuff. Making more stuff is where we would run into problems with living in a finite world. If we ran our entire economy off making steel cable, then the only way that we would be able to grow our economy would be by producing more steel cable. Unfortunately, we would not be able to grow this economy forever because eventually the world would run out of the iron ore and minerals needed to make the steel to make the cable. Of course, real economies don't just make one product, but even today, most of our growth still does come from making the same things but making more of them. In fact, we often push our economic growth in the direction of making more stuff rather than making better stuff. We don't offshore manufacturing to China because the goods produced there will be more valuable, we do it because we can make more for the same price. 
If economies were instead to focus on pursuing economic growth through producing goods and services of higher quality, then hard resource limits wouldn't be an issue. Take our cable making economy again. If this economy instead switched to producing cars, then they would be producing much more value for every unit input of raw materials, and then if they produced luxury wristwatches, they would produce even more value per unit input. Of course, you can't run an economy off making luxury wristwatches, even Switzerland has the good sense to diversify into dodgy banking, and you also can't grow an economy endlessly by just making more and more expensive products. Sometimes a project will just need a mile of steel cable. But rather than just trying to build the most valuable things we possibly can out of the materials available to us, we can instead choose to not build things that intentionally forego quality for cheapness. Fast fashion, disposables and even poorly constructed buildings are perfect examples of this. It takes just as many bricks and building materials to put together a shoddy house as it does to build one that will stand for a hundred years. It just takes more careful planning and a better tradesman. On the extreme opposite end of this spectrum, we have the digital economy. Some of the most valuable businesses in the entire world produce services that have practically zero marginal resource use. I think you would agree that watching a show on Netflix, or even watching this video right now, has provided you with some value, and it's also providing that value to hundreds of thousands of other viewers as well. It has provided this value despite the fact that my small team and I barely used any finite resources to make and share this video, apart from maybe some fossil fuels to power our computers and the data centres where it will be stored with YouTube. The value that this video provides, however small, is contributing to economic growth and can be scaled almost endlessly without running into any of the limitations of the finite world that we live on. Of course, without fully embracing the matrix or the metaverse or whichever one is more terrifying, we are still going to need real tangible goods and services, but our growth doesn't necessarily need to come from them. A combination of focusing on growth through adding value to existing resources rather than just using more of them and pushing the limits of the digital economy will mean that we can grow pretty much endlessly at our current rate, or at least give ourselves enough time to actually genuinely become multiplanetary, at which point all bets are off. So, how do we do this? The good news is that market forces are strongly encouraging the growth of the digital economy, so no problems there. The bad news is that market forces are kind of doing the opposite for everything else. Fast fashion companies are so valuable because people would rather spend $200 on a coat that they can wear half a dozen times rather than $2,000 on a coat that they can wear for the rest of their lives, and the same goes for a lot of other goods that we consume. On a national or international level, it's hard to ban these things, and it's probably counterproductive to prescribe economic policy on a video on the internet anyway. But perhaps the best thing that we can do is simply measure this issue. We supplement GDP figures with all types of different measures. GDP per capita, GDP adjusted for purchasing power parity, GDP adjusted for inflation being the most used examples. But we can do the same thing with resource use as well. If we divide total output by total material usage, we effectively get GDP per resource, though most economists have agreed to call this material productivity. If an economy grows its GDP and uses the same resources, its material productivity will increase. If an economy uses more resources but its GDP stays the same, its material productivity decreases. And you get the idea. The good news is that if we look back, we can see that material productivity is increasing in most economies that we have data on, but it's not increasing fast enough. The best first step that we can take to fixing this shortfall is to simply make this measure a big deal. By simply paying attention to this metric and giving it the same weight as we do raw GDP figures, for example, we will naturally enact policies that promote material productivity, re-elect governments that deliver strong material productivity growth, and all the while, we will be pursuing limitless growth in a finite world. Thanks for watching, mate. Bye.